Hello all my bookish friends out there in booktube land. In this video what we're taking a look at is what is gothic literature? So sounds interesting, let's dig in shall we? Most of us have heard of the expression gothic literature and gothic literature is just one of the branches of the gothic movement which contained art and architecture as well and also music. But what is it that constitutes a gothic book and by extension actually a gothic film? Because there are certain criteria which when taken as an ensemble you can identify a gothic piece of work. Now, obviously a work doesn't have to have every single piece of these but it should focus around at least a select number of them. So we're going to go through those criteria one by one. I just want to say if you stick around to the end of this video there's a bit of a bonus treat regarding how gothic literature works. So make sure not to miss out on that. The first aspect of the gothic novel is the castle or the great house, a mansion. And this is something that stemmed right from the beginning, sort of the opening gothic novel by Horace Walpole, The Castle of Otranto, and stretched through into films today where you still have things, maybe not in a castle, but it may be a large luxury apartment where something terrible happens, but a big building. And the castle is significant because the phrase for the gothic genre comes from gothic architecture. At the latter part of the 18th century and going into the 19th century, there was in the Western countries a revival in interest in the past, particularly medievalism. And people were buying castles and redoing them up with a certain style, the gothic style. And when you think of gothic, you've got those flying buttresses kind of things, sort of heavy stone, gargoyles and ornamented. But it gives you this sense of foreboding, brooding. There's lots of light and dark and shadow. And a castle really, when we think about it, makes the perfect backdrop to a book that is going to take on some troubling themes, that's going to be sinister and worry us a little bit, which is what Gothic books will do. And so that's where it got its name, was from Gothic architecture. And that is why probably the first criteria when you're reading a Gothic novel that you'll spot is it's by a castle or a great house. So you have the first novel, The Castle of Otranto, we mentioned that. You've got Wuthering Heights with, with um, its grand edifice of a stately home. And of course, probably the most famous Gothic novel of all is Dracula and his castle in Transylvania. So number one aspect of a Gothic novel is the castle. The second aspect of a Gothic novel is nature. And we're not talking about any kind of nature. You know, running through a field of buttercups is hardly anything we would put in a gothic novel. You know, Wordsworth coming across his daffodils, not gothic at all. In gothic novels, nature features very prominently, but it's wild, untamed, windswept nature. You think of storms. You think of in Frankenstein, the, the tipping down of the rain in the Outer Hebrides when a lightning flash reveals Frankenstein's monster at the window. You think of the Arctic ice that he's pursuing his monster uh, through at the beginning and at the end of the book. Um, Wuthering Heights mentioned again, you know, the Yorkshire moors, all windswept, untamed. These aspects are almost a given in the field of Gothic literature. And again, it transfers its way over into films. Gothic films, which are more sinister, there's a lot often takes place outside, in woods or in some great mansion, hidden up a mountain, windswept and tossed with avalanches and all that kind of stuff. So wild nature is part of the Gothic literature. And the reason for that, just some background, is the Gothic genre is an offshoot a lesser growth out of Romanticism, which I will do a video on at some point in the future. But the Romantic movement started um, as almost a kick against the Enlightenment, the, the focusing on reason and science, saying there's more to life than just measuring things. There is wonder, there is beauty, there are deep emotions, and nature sort of 
typified all of this. And so the Gothic genre goes with that nature, but on the wild side of nature. So that's aspect number two, wild nature. Aspect number three of the Gothic genre is the supernatural or the preternatural, as you'll often hear it referred to in the old classic books. Now, the supernatural can obviously involve ghosts and ghouls and witches, but it doesn't necessarily have to be full supernatural. Um, if you were to think of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Arthur Conan Doyle, you'll know that the, the hound is this some kind of devil demon dog, but there's actually a rational explanation for it. Or another great um, gothic piece of work is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now in that, you've, you've got this ominous feeling of, of the character Mr. Hyde and his, his sort of amorality. Um, he's almost a, a demon figure. But of course, he's not. There is a logical explanation to it. And Anne Radcliffe, who, who does um, The Mysteries of Adolfo, she always has a reasonable explanation. There are, of course, ones which bring in the actual supernatural. Quite a lot of books do. And you think of later works. Recently, we've got things like Twilight, that a gothic novel. And of course, it focuses on vampires. But it doesn't necessarily, because I don't go in for any of the supernatural in my reading, but the gothic genre will always have that uneasy, inexplicable, paranormal element. But often, very often, it has a reasonable explanation, but while you're going through the story, you can't quite put your finger on it. Another aspect of this might be the idea of an ancient prophecy. So when such and such family has three sons, the house will fall kind of thing. And this lurks in the background, no one believes it, but then inexplicable events start happening and stuff starts going wrong in the household. and you know, you start thinking, oh, this prophecy, how can a prophecy possibly be true? And that is a very central aspect of the Gothic novel. So if you have an ancient prophecy there, or things that go bump in the night, then you're, there's a good chance you're reading a Gothic novel. A fourth aspect of the Gothic novel is practically found in all of them, and that is metonymy. Now, metonymy is a device like the metaphor. It's lesser than a metaphor. A metaphor, um, you can say something is. Life is a butterfly. Um, I don't know why I picked a butterfly, but there you go. That's a metaphor. But metonymy is a little less than that. It will use something to symbolize something else, but it, it doesn't go as far as saying it is that other thing. The most classic example of metonymy in a film is when they want to get you to feel sad and low about someone's death. They have a funeral, and what's the weather always like? Raining. The rain is very symbolic. It matches the feeling, the emotion, through nature, of sadness. This is metonymy. Other examples of metonymy. Um, deep, thick fog. You think of the Sherlock Holmes novels, and you think of foggy London. Or there may be things that go bump in the night, or the squeaking of hinges, or the scratching. Wuthering Heights has this moment, and a couple of times, where the branches of the tree are bashing against the window, they're tapping. And later on, there's another, another branch tapping on the roof of the house, and it's almost like Kathy wanted to get into the house. It's metonymy. These this subform of a metaphor where a noise or a piece of nature stands for a feeling or a, or a sense of emotion. By the way, can I just take the time to say that if you appreciate um, the videos I'm putting together here and you enjoy classic literature and you want to get more out of it and understand literature more fully and get into a discussion about it, please hit the subscribe button and smash the like don't forget to smash the like button on this video because it does me the world of good in my algorithms. Anyway, back to the aspect of Gothic literature. A fifth part of the Gothic genre that you will notice is the sublime slash emotional intensity. Gothic works, as they focus on nature through the romantic appeal, they turn to the darker side. They turn to the more terror-ridden side 
of our experience as humans. To be anxious, to be confused, bewildered, lost, alone, small, insignificant. That's what the Gothic will always make you feel. Um, Anne Radcliffe, who wrote Gothic works, she said that the Gothic genre is not so much about horror, although there is now a move, there is now a genre called Gothic horror. But true Gothic isn't the horror, the, the blood and, and the death and seeing things. It's the terror, the feeling of bewilderment, the terror. You think of the film Jaws. What made that film so good in the 70s was you never saw the shark because the machine they used for the shark kept breaking so they couldn't film with it. It's not knowing where the shark is that causes nearly all of the anxiety and terror in that film. But the sublime means more than that. The sublime is to take the emotions to an elevated level to where they are overpowering. It's sort of being overawed by nature or by emotion. So it's not just being worried, it's being terrified really terrified. It's it's the kind of thing you read in bed at night. I remember I read um, And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie and there was bumps going on outside my house. I thought I'm going to be murdered in my bed. <laughs> um, it was that terror because in that book you can't find out, you can't work out who's doing all the murders. Um, and the sublime takes the human experience to being overwhelmed by a feeling. And that is also achieved through the the descriptive nature of the emotional intensity. There'll be lots of um, breathlessness and running and perspiring and uh, a person will be foaming at the mouth and there, there's a lot of shrieking and crying out. Very intense emotions um, are a hallmark of the gothic genre and that takes you to the sublime. And sublime differs from beauty because beauty you can appreciate, you can feel in love with. But the sublime is an emotion over that, which often involves unease, anxiety, worry. And obviously, if you collect them to their highest point and add those together, you have terror. But it's a, a terror that makes you feel indefensible. You worry, even as the reader, you feel like the person in the book's going to get you or someone's in your house waiting to, you know, do you in with a meat cleaver. <laughs> You know what I mean if you've read these books. So that is a key aspect to the Gothic genre, the sublime. The sixth aspect is an interesting one. Um, and again, will commonly feature, it's the past. The past always plays or has a deeply influencing role on a Gothic piece of work. Um, it's almost linked to consequences. And so you will find that in most Gothic stories, there's some kind of backstory somewhere behind everything. Or maybe it's halfway through, you meet a character who will say, oh, there was an ancient, again, the ancient prophecy, for instance, or there was once a person who lived in that house and this, that, and the other happened to them. And they always said they would come back and wreak havoc. The past always comes into play, or maybe it's something a classic example in, in suspense films, children do something when they're at school, at high school, and years later it catches up with them. But you can't quite outrun its sort of bony fingers trying to reach you. So there's another feature of Gothic literature. The past involves itself heavily on the present. A seventh feature of the Gothic genre is individualism and a powerful central character. Often this character is male and will dominate over a woman, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. As with the classic Wuthering Heights, Kathy is the dominant character who sort of holds sway over everybody else. But also Heathcliff, his raw animalism and how he imposes his weight, his force upon those around him and his will. This is a key characteristic. Mr. Rochester in Jane Eyre, a powerful brooding figure who's almost immovable, set in a big house, you know? <laughs> You've got the Gothic genre with a past story as well. So that is always a key feature of Gothic literature. We'll always have an heroic character who often, by the way, is sort of your hero villain. Because we're exploring darker themes, the darker side of human nature, 
the hero, there tends to be something very questionable about him, and he's too dominant, he's too forceful, um, there's something malevolent about him. And this is a key factor in Gothic literature, because Gothic literature is all about, from that romantic ideal, intensity, but the intensity of the untamed. So these characters fit very well in untamed nature, in heavy buildings with a dark past. You see how it all comes together to give a certain feel. Number eight in the aspects that make up the Gothic genre is confinement. This is very high on the list. Confinement, the sense of being trapped. So, um, Jane Eyre, she's put in the Red Room, isn't she? And it makes her like, you know, go out of her mind. And she's worried about the supernatural, the ghost of her uncle, I think it is. And, you know, she's terrified. This terror comes in, the sublimeness of the feeling. You've got that. When you think about Frankenstein, there they are out in the Arctic ice. Well, they're confined, wild nature, but they're trapped. They're isolated from everywhere else. I was thinking about this, going into movies, for instance. There's that classic Hitchcock movie, The Rear Window. Towards the end of the film, you know that the character, the main character, um, the murderer is coming for him. He is in a wheelchair. He is confined. And we sense, this gives us a sense of terror, an inability to escape the inevitable. And it lifts all nervous feelings, all anxiety, all worry. It lifts it higher because you are unable to get away from it. You feel that you are totally vulnerable. You are overawed by the panic that is coming. So you get that. And when you read it or watch it, you get that sublime sense of the power of our emotions when they're allowed to swell up and run riot in us. So that's another feature, confinement. You'll nearly always find it in a work of Gothic literature. Now I could go on with more aspects of Gothic literature. Um, but I'm going to leave it there. Sometimes you have women in distress, for instance, but it, it's not as key an item. You can have um, sort of the, 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 the counterbalance in the yin-yang in Gothic literature, sort of doubles. So um, you've got someone living this life over this side and someone living this life over this side, and you get to contrast their lives back and forth, but there's a, a dark energy between the two. Um, funnily enough, when it comes to doubles, Twins are often used as an unnerving feature in Gothic literature at times. Um, people who turn up and look like somebody else. It may not be an actual twin, it might be a doppelganger who brings a past memory to life and all sorts of things begin to happen. There's the past coming in again. Things that are uncanny. So a person may have lived their life as a child somewhere and later on um, they feel they're being followed by somebody and a piece of jewellery is bought them by a friend and that piece of jewellery looks just like something they had when they were a child. And there's this link and it's uncanny. That also comes into the Gothic genre, but it doesn't necessarily have to be there like the other aspects of Gothic literature. Now, I did say earlier that if you stuck around to the end, I've got a little surprise treat for you. And what that is, I thought, after going through the aspects of the Gothic novel, I thought, what would happen if we tried to just put a bunch of them into the beginning of a story? How would it sound? Would it live up to that Gothic idea? And so, I don't know if you can see this, but I jotted away a story off the top of my head. And um, I thought I'd read it. Let's see if we can hear the gothic inspiration in this opening of a story. It's a few pages long. So let's see how it goes, shall we? The Castle Classic, I've called it classic because in honour of my channel. The Castle Classic, so I was told, lay a good ten miles offshore upon an unnatural clag of boulders, like a malignant boil growing out of the sea, as the locals said. By all accounts, the castle was a grim place, dark, heavy, a solid fortress, stripped of the ornaments and romance of its fellow castles. Why should it not be? I had said to my housekeeper at my lodgings, a highly imaginative and superstitious breed of woman. 
To adorn a structure exposed to the wild Atlantic winds and barbarous waves would be pure folly. Would you have them add a stained glass window as well? No doubt the walls are metres thick and the windows small to keep out the storms. I wonder not that it is dark and heavy in such a situation. That's as may be, she said, but I think it's still best to leave well clear. Tis haunted and make no mistake. I rolled my eyes. It's true as I am here afore you. Tis said that the old lord that built that place had a disfigurement of the devil and hid away from his tenants on that island. She paused as if waiting for me to be converted to the belief on the spot. Tis said that they took girls and children to him, which he feasted on by night, and they can still be heard about the island. Pure poppycock, to be sure. I've visited enough places to know that a building, whether isolated or dilapidated, cannot sit too long near a village of rustics before acquiring an horrific history. Though the worst thing that ever took place was that someone once pricked a finger on a thistle there. It was around 2pm that my transport to Castle Classic unloosed from the small wharf and, and careened out into the steel grey sea. I sensed the billows be coming in before too soon, said my pilot as he leapt back and forth the small boat, adjusting it to the Atlantic wind. It seems pretty fine and calm to me, I said. I wouldn't wager it if I were you. Things is never what they should be at the Isle. It's a forsaken place. Look at it yonder. One can barely see it. I confess that at this point I hadn't actually seen it, but at the sailor's comment I searched the horizon. It took a few moments, but I soon noticed a dark, protruding tip of rock coming through a haze some miles off. It was hard to spot it because of the greyish underclouds which reflected a slate grey upon the cold waves, and the island itself was evidently beset by a localised pall or mist. Ghostly, innit? Not at all, I said, not wanting a repeat of my housekeeper's tittle-tattle. It is a perfectly understood phenomenon. A large cut of land standing so isolated in the raging seas will always accumulate either mists or clouds about it. The sailor looked at me. He was smiling with his crooked teeth, but I sensed a shortness of breath, a wheezing of anxiety, as if he were trying to feign an easy attitude, but failing. He looked westward again and said, Well, it ain't just mists and clouds which floats about that they're Tartarus. They says the souls of any sailors misfortunate enough to drown on those rocks are never to be freed, but are bound in a watery purgatory forever. Ugh. He shivered at his own phantasms. Anyway, you shouldn't see me set a foot on her, no sir. This is so far as I can take you. And he began to rummage in a wooden box in the bow with a split lid. What do you mean we stop here? You can't take me any further, I cried. Do you think I intend to swim the rest? Don't panic, sir. I don't mean you to swim. Your transport shall soon appear, just you see. And he cast a sly, almost wicked eye at me. Just none of the fishermen of the village will ever close more than three miles with that place. This was preposterous, a more abject, muddle-headed, foolish, superstitious group of people I had never met with. I was in no mood for any more of this nonsense. Listen, my man, I have paid you honest money to take me to Castle Classic, and you shall take me there this moment. And so you will, sir, as you shall see. Just watch the mist there. As we had been speaking, the pilot had attached a red triangular cloth to a rope, which he had hoisted to the top of the mast. Evidently, it was a signal of some kind. I watched the mist. Annoyed, yes, but morbidly curious. A thicker band of clouds were growing gloomy, low on the horizon, and the wind began to sigh and moan. Look, sir, said my crewmate, the mist began to swirl and eddy at one place, 
as though someone had coughed into the steam from a boiling pan. And then, starting first like a bony finger, the opaque silhouette of a vessel began to creep silently into view. Nobody hailed from the mysterious craft, and it seemed unreal, almost skeletal, as it skulked warily through the white shroud. It was probably due to the constant insinuations of my rustic associates, but from within the mist, or even beyond it, there seemed to be the sound of laughter, impish giggles, and hints of snickers. No doubt it was just some wave tops being stirred by the incoming billows. So, I know that that was a lot of baloney, but I hope you appreciate the exercise in putting a number of aspects of a gothic novel into an opening book. I have no idea where that book was going, I haven't planned anything. I just made it up as I went along, thinking, well, we need a castle, we need something superstitious, maybe a bit of the past, we need the wild, we need a sense of foreboding and terror which would grow in the book. So they're all the things that I began to put in there. And I think you can see immediately now that we've gone through the aspects, how to identify a gothic novel instantly. Anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed this video. If you have, please remember to subscribe. And could I ask you, if you enjoyed the videos you watch here, please forward them or recommend them to other people on your Instagram or Facebook or YouTube accounts. Um, it would help me immensely and I'd be very appreciative. Anyway, until the next video, I wish you joy in your reading.